Sometimes we need to pause and bring you up to speed on a little bit of history to help you understand what's going on today in American gun law and the Second Amendment. Specifically, I want to talk about the history of serializing firearms in the United States and the Anglosphere so you can put into context this crazy idea by Joe Biden to force you and I to have to have serialized firearms, even the ones that we make. Let's talk about it when we get back. You're going to like this. It's going to be geeky. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of the Four Box of Diner, proud American gun owner, constitutional attorney, member of the United States Supreme Court Bar, and author of the brand new best-selling book, Disarmed, What the Ukraine War Teaches Americans About the Right to Bear Arms. For those of you who've read the book, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And don't forget, if you haven't already done so, to put a review on Amazon.com. Uh, those make a big difference uh, with me and my publisher. We're already talking about our next book. I'm still thinking about it. So if you have ideas, feel free to send me some thoughts because uh, I'm trying to figure that out now. All right, folks. So I've been on Twitter now about a year. I did not join for many years, obviously, but I finally joined because I thought it was important to try to expand the knowledge of this channel and the information contained on it because I think it's important that the Second Amendment movement have this information because I think my information is, is quite good, scholarly, and hard to find uh, for most people that have real lives and real jobs. So I want to provide this to you in an easy-to-use format. So I got on Twitter. I've been on there just about one year right now, I think was my first tweet or so. Um, and sometimes I get some really great information on Twitter. So there's a lot of people out there that are really sharp. Uh, I get ideas and thoughts, and I appreciate that. So one thing I came across in the last few days uh, was from an excellent attorney uh, out in California, Costas Moros. Uh, and Costas here is an excellent attorney, does a lot of Second Amendment work. You probably have read about his work uh, in the newspapers. But he was exchanging a couple tweets uh, with a professor named Drew Stevenson. I don't know uh, Professor Stevenson. He's a professor, though. Seems like a very knowledgeable, uh, intelligent guy. He's the Wayne Fisher Research Professor and a professor of law at the South Texas College of Law, uh, Drew Stevenson. And he had sent around a uh, page of an interesting book by Scott Paul Gordon about a, a Moravian rifle goes to war disarming and arming Pennsylvania in 1775 to 1776 in the Journal of Mid-Atlantic Studies. I'll try to put a link to a couple of these things down below. Uh, in that article, uh, as according to what Professor Stevenson posted, there was a page out of a, that talked about how at the time of our founding, there was indeed some serialization of government-owned or owned firearms where the government owned firearms and loaned them out. And as part of that, maintaining the order to make sure that when the government or state gave out the gun to their soldiers, they would get that gun back and to make sure that the soldiers themselves would not confuse each other's guns in the event that one soldier cleaned his gun and the other didn't. There was no confusion about whose gun was whose. So in this article, uh, there's a couple quotes here, and then we're going to talk about the history of serialization in the United States. But I want to start what start off where um, you know I sort of got thinking about this in the context of, of course, the Supreme Court's ghost gun case, and then this article being discussed on uh, Twitter, specifically they refer to the order rifle. That's O E R T E R. The order rifle received. Uh, various things. And what they said, for example, is this. This is in the article about the order rifle. Perhaps, well, perhaps like many weapons gathered and used by military companies, military companies, the order rifle received a number. Captains regularly marked the arms that they distributed, an early tracking system that enabled that a soldier return the arms he had been given and that kept together different items uh, in a stand of arms. So there's a series of discussions about this, which I found to be quite interesting. But the question, of course, I had is, will the anti-gun movement try to use this? Probably so, but it's not going to get them any far. And I want to talk about this right now. You see, if you go back to the 18th century, the use of these markings on arms was, of course, to make sure that the quartermasters or uh, the guys responsible for the firearms to hand out to the soldiers would get them back. But this is very important. I want to touch fingers with something that goes on today in modern life, and you can see what I'm saying. Today, you see these BS terms called gun by 
buyback programs in American life today. So police department will do, we're going to have a gun buyback program today. Now that's a BS term. And why do I say that? Because when I say I'm going to buy back something, it of course implies that I have sold you something, right? I sell you something, I buy it back from you. That's why it's called a buyback. But of course, what the government does with their sleight of hand today is they pretend that the buyback program is we, the government, sold it to you. But that's not true because these were privately owned firearms today that you bought from an FFL or from someone, whatever, and then you would decide to sell it to the government. It's not a buyback. It's simply a sale or a deal. No, like, like nothing else. But that is different than what's talking about in the 18th century here with these kinds of articles because at the time of our founding, when People, you know, it was not unusual for people to form their own militia companies. Like George Washington had his own militia, and if the people that form these militias or the Continental Army, if they go out and buy a whole host of weaponry that they then loan out to soldiers or loan out to others to use, when those individuals or those soldiers are done using the weapons, they want those weapons back to the militia because they're not owned by the individuals. They're owned by the military company. They're owned by the militia company. They're owned by the Continental Congress. They're owned by the Continental Army, whatever, but they're not actually owned by the soldiers. So the reason why you have these markings at the time of the founding is not because the government wants to track privately owned firearms owned by private Americans just for private reasons. No, it's specifically an attempt to maintain the inventory of government property. It's government agents monitoring and maintaining and recovering government property. Perfectly fine, no big deal there, but it's not a historical analog that can be used by the anti-gunners to say that you and I as private citizens have to have or must make guns with serial numbers. It is not a historical analog because, again, it's really just government property and government uh, recovery of government property from people that were loaned it out. Totally separate than you and I having our own private guns. So where does the notion of serialization come from after the revolution? Well, the first time we really see, and I'm going to keep it very general, but I basically got the history about perfect here. Um, so we really start to see this uh, in the mid 19th century, we see this in England and in Ireland. Reminder that in England, you had an ongoing religious fight between the Protestants and the Catholics. And the reason why this is important is it goes all the way back to Henry VIII. And Henry VIII was originally a staunch defender of the Catholic Church and the Pope. But then when he could not get the divorce he wanted from Catherine of Aragon, a very religious Catholic, who was a daughter of the Spanish king, a Catholic country, when Henry VIII could not get the annulment, the divorce, the annulment from the Pope, because the Pope did not want to offend his Catholic allies in, the, in Spain, Henry VIII decided that he was going to create a Protestant Church of England separate and apart from the Pope. So he created the Church of England, which would, of course, then give him the authority to get his divorce from Catherine of Aragon so he could go off and marry Anne Boleyn, and on we go. And now we have a massive fight in Europe over Protestants versus the Catholic Church, which we're not going to get into here, except to say that in the United States, we wanted to avoid all those kinds of religious conflicts, which is why we have the Bill of Rights. And in the Bill of Rights, the First Amendment says, there shall not be an establishment of a national religion. That doesn't mean that religion can't be in life. You can't pray at a football game. That's not what it's about. It's saying that we can't have a single national religion established by the government telling that we all have to be Catholics or Protestants. That's what this was all about. But with that context in mind, remember that in the 19th century, we still had these laws on the books that treated, in England at least, Protestants to be superior to the Catholics, in part because there was a series of wars between the Protestants and the Catholics, and there was always a fear in England that the Catholics would come out of the woodwork and would overthrow the British king who was a Protestant, or the British queen who was a Protestant. Okay, So as a result of that, there were very strict gun laws on almost all Catholics, unless you're extremely wealthy, because the Catholics were viewed as enemy, a potential enemy of the state. So as a consequence, in 1843, Parliament in England passed an act to amend and continue the laws in 
Ireland relative to the registering of arms. And under that, 19, uh, under that 1843 law, I should say, again, 1843, let me be clear, 1843, under that English parliamentarian law that applied to the Catholics in Ireland, right, the Irish Catholics, um, it specifically says to have arms, a person was required to submit an application and an official had to determine whether the applicant was fit and proper, uh, was a fit and proper person. Does this sound like may issue permitting regimes in places like New York before Brew? Yes, it does, because that's what it all was, of course. And again, part of it also said that when any person shall be found carrying arms, a justice of the peace would be allowed to examine the markings of the firearm and require that the person to identify himself to ensure that the firearm was indeed registered. Again, this is about controlling. This gun control was religiously motivated against Catholics enacted by the English Parliament in 1843. I'll put a link to this down below so you can check it out. So that's what went on in Europe in England specifically vis-a-vis -vis the Catholics. Because again, the Protestants that ran England didn't like the Catholics because of prior religious wars. Okay, now here in the United States, however, we have no, no laws involving the serialization of private firearms until the 20th century. Now the reason I, why I told you the story about the 18th century serialization of government guns when handed out to government soldiers, and I also told you the story of the 1843 law was not random. It was to make a point. It shows that there was at least a history and understanding that you could, technologically speaking at least, mark guns or serialize guns or, in other words, you know, serialize or somehow mark up the guns. You could do that technologically speaking. But in the United States, that was just never done because we do not have the same historical tradition of regulating firearms like these other oppressive, quasi-tyrannical type countries that simply don't trust we the people. Remember, even today, there's an English king, King Charles, and before that was Queen Elizabeth, who was quite a nice queen, as best I can tell. Nevertheless, we in America don't have kings and queens, no matter how much the Joe Biden administration is trying to create one. In America, so the first time we have any inkling of like the commercial regulation of firearms is in 1938, just a few years before World War II. And the Secretary of the United States Treasury uh, was given certain authority under what's known as the Federal Firearms Act, the Federal Firearms Act of 1938. What's interesting in the Federal Firearms Act of 1938 is there was no legal duty imposed to mark serial numbers on firearms even though the Secretary of the Treasury was granted a general power to prescribe regulations, but these regulations that were promulgated included no serial number requirement. So even when you have the first commercial regulation of firearms in the United States in 1938 at the federal level, no reference to serial numbers. And that's because the first federal regulation touching fingers with serial numbers on firearms arises in the year of our Lord, 1958, where the Secretary of the Treasury for the first time promulgates a regulation, a regulation, mind you, not a congressional statute, a regulation requiring that serial numbers be engraved on certain firearms. Now, these excluded, by the way, uh, shotguns as well as 22 caliber rifles. Uh, so this is quite interesting. Specifically, the law provided that each licensed manufacturer and importer of a firearm produced on or after July 1st, 1958, shall identify it, it shall identify that firearm by stamping or otherwise known as impressing or otherwise conspicuously placing or causing to be stamped or impressed um, in a manner not susceptible to being readily obliterated or altered the name of the manufacturer or importer and the serial number caliber um, serial number caliber model designation all that now here's what's interesting though uh, it specifically says that the individual serial numbers and the model designations do not need to be required on any shotguns or on any two twenty or on any twenty-two caliber rifles, with the exception to the extent that a shotgun or rifle fell under the NFA. So again, the bottom line is in uh, 1958, you have some firearms in the United States are serialized. Uh, in the commercial context. But again, it's not that Americans had to do it, it's that the manufacturers and importers of firearms had to do it under certain circumstances. Then you get to the critical law today that the, the Biden administration is trying to fight about, and that's the Gun Control Act of 1968. And under that act, it provided specifically that licensed importers and licensed manufacturers shall identify by means of a serial number 
uh, engraved or cast on the receiver or frame of the weapon in such a manner as the secretary shall, by regulations prescribed, each firearm imported or manufactured by such importer or manufacturer, period, close quote. That was the Gun Control Act of 1968. Now, here's the thing. The regulations that have arose under that war, you know, adopted back then in various ways. But the critical thing to understand was that in 1986, right, 1986, almost 20 years after the Gun Control Act of 1968, there was a federal piece of legislation, the Firearms Owners Protection Act, that came out by Congress that actively focused on laser beaming, I should say laser focused on cutting back on the authority of the ATF to promulgate regulations because Congress thought that the regulations that the ATF had been promulgating up until 1986 were too overreaching and broad and tyrannical, and therefore they all wanted to get that cut back to take that authority away from the ATF to frankly just make stuff up that they didn't like involving firearms. So Congress dramatically cut back on that authority. And that's why you see language like in 18 U.S.C. 922.6 little a that specifically talks about they can only act only uh, as is necessary. So you start to see words like only can do and necessarily uh, all sorts of things that are really limiting language to ATF's authority. That was not a mistake. That was not happenstance or a coincidence. That was because Congress specifically thought the ATF was a rogue agency. And this, by the way, uh, was in 1986 before Waco or Ruby Ridge or all these other things occurred. So just think about how that was uh, viewed. This was in the 80s during the Reagan administration before Clinton took over the ATF. Nevertheless, I digress. So finally, I want to just say the only other thing to keep in mind in terms of this kind of general chronology of serialization issues in the United States is we have to remember there is a Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms overlay here. Now, we've talked about this repeatedly, which under the text of the Second Amendment, the people have the right to keep and bear arms, which means the right to keep means to possess, the right to bear means to carry. We know that obviously in order to have the, the ability to have a gun, to carry a gun, to possess a gun, you need to be able to acquire the gun. And that might be by inheritance, uh, by making your own gun or by buying a gun. Uh, but I bring this all up because the Hunter Biden judge, Judge Mary Ellen Norica, uh, who's the one who's presiding over the Hunter Biden case and is the one that uncovered and smelled a rat and blew up that, that sweetheart plea deal. She's the one that caught the little games that was getting played with her questions. And she, this is the same exact judge that in late 2022 is the one that actually held that the Second Amendment's right to keep and bear arms guarantees the right to be able to make your own gun because she recognized you can't have a gun without being able to acquire it. And one way you acquire it is to make your own gun. And there was a, his, no historical tradition of making your own gun. So too, of course, uh, there's no historical tradition, as we've just talked about in the time of the founding, of serializing guns outside of the context of convenience for government quartermasters wanted to make sure that the guns they loaned out came back so they could be reused. That had nothing to do with private ownership or anything along those lines. That was simply, again, maintaining government-owned property in a, in a safe and efficient and useful way so you actually got the property back. Okay. So anyway, so that's kind of the big picture. I've walked you through the history here from the time of our founding through you know, English Irish history in the 19th century showing that the technology of serialization, serializing guns did exist, but the United States did not even think about adopting this until the second half of the 20th century because, again, the firearms, the Federal Firearms Act of 1938 did not require this. This is the first Federal Firearms Act touching on the commercial regulation of firearms and the making of firearms. Nothing about serialization. We don't see any references to serialization in the United States in terms of the government imposing on private actors until 19. 1958, and of course the Gun Control Act of 1968, but don't forget the Firearms Owners Protection Act of 1986 that cuts back on ATF's authority given to it in 1968, and that is the law that the Supreme Court is dealing with it's in this Garland versus Vanderstuck case. All right, folks, hope you learned a little bit something today on this little history of serialization of guns uh, in the last few hundred years. Again, uh, don't forget to subscribe to the Four Boxes Diner, and we'll see you again soon here at the Four Boxes Diner. Orders up. Table 2A.